Well, thank you, Kirsten, and thank you for clarification about the University of Newcastle in West Sussex. Uh, the, the, the conversation went on in Norway to, uh, oh, tell me about your local football team. And I said, oh, my local football team's Crawley Town. And they'd never heard of Crawley Town. And I'm, 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 I'm trying to tell people about Crawley Town just at the moment because they're doing extremely well, most remarkably well for a tiny, un, un, relatively unsupported football team. So... But uh, there we are. I, I, that's not, however, the topic of today. Uh, but it, uh, thank you very much for clarifying that where I where I belong uh, in uh, as of now. Um, the U actually, my connections with Newcastle are now getting pretty distant. Um, right. Well, speaking truth to power, uh, I was always taken with the title of Aaron Wildowski's book. Um, which was published, of course, in 1979, around about the time policy and politics came to Bristol. Um, I always, the, the, the daft thing about like, liking a book's title and then not actually going and reading it is that you, you get the idea that it's going to do a lot of things that it doesn't do. Uh, and I thought I would find in the book a very dated exposition of rational policy analysis. <laughs> Instead, I found uh, a book full of provocative wit and wisdom, uh, and there's a nice and a tiny bit I chose to quote, rationality resides in connecting what you want with what you can do. And that seems a pretty good position to start, so I'm, I'm certainly not going to fall out with Aaron Wildowski at this stage. Um, so, there we are. That, that's... The, the other thing, of course, about that, that face the dilemma that faces me this afternoon is the dilemma that uh, that uh, faces you whenever you choose a catchy title, uh, and then subsequently have to write the paper that goes with it. Uh, and uh, again, I think some dilemma, particularly because I can't just sit, sit here and 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 say how Aaron Wildavsky got it wrong, for example. I mean, the reality is this. Uh, that there's nothing new about a problem about speaking truth to power. Um, many have recognised that while governments aspire to rationality and seemingly seek advice on how to do that, the reality is often a deafness to that advice. So the question uh, for this lecture is how we view this issue now and what, if anything, we can do about it. Um, I think there's an interesting kind of Im Im implicit uh, assumption here, which may, maybe not everybody in this room would share. And it was actually very nicely put uh, by the pro vice chancellor at introducing us today, where he talked about the crosstalk between policy and practice. Uh, and that, again, it seems, for, for me at least, sums up what I am about. As a, and there's a question. The, the question here is, is obviously a question around about why do we study this topic. And I think in, in, as much, in studying and being concerned about public policy in its various forms, there is, to me at least, an implicit assumption that you're doing it in order to try to improve policy and or the policy process. Um, and, and therefore... I, I start from that position, and it's, it's fundamental to, to what I want to say this afternoon. Now, back to the dilemma of the title. Should I have chosen a more modest title? Uh, speaking truth to power, something with which we've not had much success. Why should we expect to do any better now? Um, is that a, a clearly a, a possible alternative modest version of, of my original title? The we in this context means the body of academics who are interested to teach and to, and to, to research the policy process. Um, I, ha I have to say that um, I think in terms of actually speaking to power, my personal role has been extremely modest. Uh, I think of all the plenary speakers at this event, I'm the one who's done the least speaking 
power, truthfully or untruthfully, uh, as the case may be. My contributions have been very much on detailed matters, very much in, in my, uh, my years at, at, uh, here in Bristol at Source, issues about the, the development of the social security system, a lot of time devoted to issues about the development of the housing benefit system, and then later on, quite a long concern over a long period of time with issues about appeal systems, ending up where the closest I got to power was the, the me membership of a fairly obscure public body that has since been abolished, namely the Council on Tribunals. Um, and then in a sense, speak, far from speaking truth to power, a lot of my work, and again this goes very much back to my, my, my position in Bristol, a lot of my work has been more about helping local authorities to cope with what power throws at them. Uh, and that again seems an important <laughs> related role. And, in, and it's this notion that, 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 that the one wants to speak, interpret the issues about speaking truth to power or about power in, in, in a broad way. So I say my, my own contribution has been fairly modest. Um, the most, uh, and my family's contribution has been fairly modest with one significant exception. My grandfather was an upholsterer who kept, looked after the benches in the Houses of Parliament. Um, so I have an ancestor who, if he didn't speak truth to power, at least sought to make power comfortable. <laughs> So what are we talking about? Uh, <clears throat> the, policy, the, the policy process uh, and the, the, the whole agenda of policy can be seen in a, a variety of ways. Um, policy and policy advocacy, issues about the policy process. And my own contribution has more been about the study of the policy process than about particular policy issues, notwithstanding some of my Early, uh, earlier career efforts indeed to contribution to policy debates. So I'm going to rather concentrate on the question of the policy process, but it's of course extraordinarily difficult to separate in practice talking about policy and talking about the policy process. We're talking about some very important things about means, ends, relationships. Uh, and of course, whenever you talk about the, you talk about a, a process issue like, for example, privatisation, we have in sense a series of concerns about outcomes. Um, so I, I, there are the, the kind of three parts to what I want to say. Uh, what knowledge do we draw on when we try to speak truth? Is anybody in power listening? And then the last part of it still is in, is the situation any different now? Um, and the clearly policy studies implicitly is implicitly practice orient practice oriented, but also often very critical. And a, con a, a policy studies discourse that often directly challenges the discourse with which much public policy making is justified. So often, therefore, one has to gain this interaction between the actual context of the decisions and the issue about saying there are better ways of making decisions. Now, where, where, are, where are we going in, in terms of the discipline? Uh, I want to raise the issue of towards or away from practicality. And I think those of you who are much more concerned than I am with the day-to-day -day business of trying to satisfy universities and funding bodies <coughs> about uh, what you're doing well, you can doubtly co 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 comment on this rather better than I can. Um, but I think some, some general things are, are appropriate here. Uh, this book by Collini, which defends the traditional eye of, of the university, drawing back on the 19th century work of John Henry Newman, uh, reflects on how subjects initially seen as practical evolved as a wider academic discourse developed. And therefore, you, there is kind of an interesting question here about as we get better intellectually, does the practical content of our truth as far as decline. And 
Is there, in that sense, a tension, I put it here, as between speaking truth to power and speaking to students, I could equally said speaking truth to power and speaking to each other in the context of talking about our, our research activities, with, of course, problematic issues here about the meaning of truth. And I think there's an interesting question, which I'll come back to, about the extent to which a discipline like ours, but I'm, I'm using ours in generic terms about policy studies, a discipline like this has, uh, in the long run, to have to keep its links with questions of practicality. <coughs> Where does policy analysis stand as a discipline? There's the policy science approach. And I quote here Slager, on this, uh, mountain islands of theoretical structure, occasionally attached together by foothills of shared methods and concepts and empirical work, surrounded by oceans of descriptive work. And that is quoted by Paul Sabatier in his concluding essay in his book on the theories of the policy process. And it's implicit in Sabatier's uh, quotation of that, that he regards that as an unsatisfactory situation. The theory has got to build. The science has got to be developed. And it's clear, this is clearly a perspective, strong, still I think strongly held in the United States, which I do think we need to, 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 to look at rather uh, skeptically. Um, in fact, of course, there is one area where there is a certain amount of systematization, and that's around public choice theory. And I'm not going to stand up here and give you a, a, a five-minute critique of public choice theory, but I think it's, I mean, I think Hindmore rather puts his finger on it in as much as he says it is, it, it should be regarded as a source, source of hypotheses. And if it's regarded as a source of hypotheses, you find in practice that, of course, extraordinarily few of those hypotheses have been tested, and those that have been tested have quite often been refuted. Uh, the late Eleanor Ostrom has, I think, a lovely essay, uh, which is, by public choice theory standards, uh, extremely modest in its claims. And she it ends up, I think this is a presidential address or something, she ends up with demanding a lot more, going back to the psychological laboratories to, to learn a lot more about how people work with interests. And frankly, I, I, I think that is a, an approach that is going nowhere, but I won't, I won't go further than that. There may be those amongst you who disagree. So what are the alternatives? Um, well, I've, I know, I'll start with a quote that at least one person in this room should, be, should agree with, uh, from Pollitt and Burkhardt, um, and uh, which I very much like, the, talking about the importance of the empirical testing of theories and hypotheses, accepting that there's a, this is only one kind of test and that arguments concerning whether the appropriate conditions for falsi falsification can be met will never cease. And again, a bit further on, reality is socially constructed, but not all constructions have equal claim to our credulity. Another person who I think, who, who, whose discussions of social science, a theory and methods, as far as the study of policy is concerned, is particularly useful, is Colin Hay, uh, and who refers to the extent to which our most significant explanatory variables do not avail themselves of quantification or simple measurement, and that this description is the basis from which interpretation and explanation must build. Now, if you, and that, you know, it's a, a brief lightning effort to try and state where I think the, the, kind of, the state of the art in the study of the policy process is. But it, if it, it gives us, therefore, in a position in which what, what might, we might say, what is policy process analysis actually doing? It's describing systematically. It's observing regularities and generalizing, and not in general terms, prescribing. And it's making critical and often negative judgments, particularly about simplified prescriptions. So if that's the, if you accept that as the general state of the art of the discipline, then let's go then back to the questions about 
relevance. I think, actually, when we seek to give our work intellectual coherence, it's easy to forget why we are doing it. Are we engaged in an analytical and definitional game, or in something that helps us to address real-world issues? And I wanted to give you an example uh, from, indeed, the same event in, in Norway, a workshop on street-level bureaucracy, um, where we got, there was a brilliant paper by uh, some researchers from Denmark <coughs> on issues about the role of a group of three different groups of street level bureaucrats, uh, uh, home nurses, health visitors, as we would call them in this country, um, nursery school teachers, and primary school teachers. And they were concerned with looking at the way in which these people operated in the context of the need that they should be early identifiers of children at risk. And we also, we, we started with a lovely piece of work, and we sat around uh, at the end of the workshop discussing the replication of this Danish work in another country. And, you know, after we, we, we got along, along a little bit and, uh, uh, and discussing how, what, what a wonderful study it would be to replicate and how interesting their methods were and so on, but th without addressing at that stage, why replicate? And I, think we, and, and I think that pulled us up rather sharp when we had to stop and say, well, why replicate? Are, are we replicating because they've got a method that is particularly good? Uh, are we replicating because we think it might be interesting to see whether the United Kingdom is different from Denmark, uh, or, or what? And, and I think I, I, maybe I said something about well, I, one of our problems would be in the UK selling this to a grant giver. Uh, and and, and the, you know, it brought us back sharp about, well, why, why study street-level bureaucrats in this context? And I think there is actually a very good reason to understand the work of people of this kind and to understand how they may have difficulties in accommodating the regular everyday task with this rather special task of being sharp and good at identifying children at risk. But, that, did you, but you need to focus on that to make sense of it. You don't want to say, oh, how interesting, let's replicate street-level bureaucrats studies all over the world, rather as I think we were intent, inclining to do. So, I mean, those are a series of things about our discipline. I don't know how I'm running on, not too, not too bad. Um, now then, is power listening? And perhaps linking up, first of all, with, uh, with what I've been saying already, I think that we are in a position, if we're trying to speak to power, we can be caught between an explanation between an expectation of a systematic approach and the question whether this is, in a sense, a scientific approach and the need to be relevant. And I must say, I've always found it in a sense, easier either to answer, answer the kind of intellectual questions or the policy-relevant questions in relation to a particular idea, a particular project, but find it quite difficult to put the two together. Um, and, of course, in doing that, again, we're expected to be practical and not tentative. And, of course, then, how tentative we are depends a great deal on what we're trying to say. Um, there is, as far as power is concerned, a recept receptivity to hard evidence. Uh, clearly most feasible with some issues at the evaluation end and with therefore some aspects of the study of implementation um, uh, and where you can talk about the determinants of outputs and outcomes. But of course, I wouldn't be the first one to have observed that the lack of st policy stability makes the difficulties when you're trying to look at outcomes in the context of a, a process which is political. But, so, but in there, even then, it's, it's, that's only some part of the study of the policy process. Um, 
Let me just uh, kind of refer back to the, to the field in which I've done a lot of work and, and back to indeed to something I particularly associate with here, with work of Bristol and particularly of work with the late Susan Barrett, uh, and that is the study of implementation. Um, and it's very interesting that uh, the famous sort of United Kingdom example of uh, the top-down approach is exemplified by, a, by a, a, something that was originally Lewis Gunn's lecture to civil servants. And it was a classic thing that kind of civil servants love. It was explicit propositions with recommendations which can be set out on a single sheet of paper. It's that essential sort of simplicity of it. And then when people like ourselves came along and said, well, that's all very well to talk about implementation like that, uh, that but the implementation process is complicated by politics. Uh, and that the problem with top-down recommendations is to say, uh, to, to say that, that the policymakers should simplify that which is particularly difficult to simplify for political reasons. And to also say in that context that indeed sometimes the bottom knows best, is to place yourself in a position in which it's much more difficult to speak to power and it's much more difficult to get power's attention than if you're coming along with some nice straightforward proposition where you should do this, this and this and things will start to go right. And I think this is the kind of difficulty we get into in the study of the policy process. Excuse me, fiddling around with these notes. There ought to be a system we were saying at the beginning where I could see the notes that I I put in on the slides to start with. But I think on the whole I can do without this now as I'm into my stride. Um, uh, of course, in all this about speaking truth to power, it may also depend on who you're trying to talk to. Uh, if you, your model of power is something fragmented and contested, as mine is, then, of course, what you're engaged in is talking to some people with some power. And I think that raises a lot of more interesting options because the possibilities of a dialogue in certain situations with certain kinds of people. Um, there's also, of course, the importance of recognizing variations in the extent to which decision making is politicized. And some areas of activity are, in a sense, much less politicized. And that perhaps it is rather more easy to work with something of the kind of the rational model of the policy process. Um, process issues can, may be less politicized than policy issues. Um, and of course, we may a particular contribution that those of us who look at process issues can make is that we can be critical of method of ways of uh, politicizing the process issues, particularly, for example, to pick one at random, the obsession of a, a while ago with joined up government. So, summing up so far, I suggest policy analysis an activity weakened by our academic doubts and there the policymakers' lack of interest. Process analysis propositions are often complex. Outcomes depend upon realism about the process. There is, in a sense, a, a bit of a route to frustration here. Now, the bit about still talking to power. I, I've set out a list, which I have no intention of talking to here, uh, about the variety of ways in which people are alleging there is a change in the policymaking world. Uh, there's a, I mean, there's an enormous lot of, of it around at the moment, books, uh, academic books, popular books, all sorts of things. And so these issues are on the agenda. And implicit in these issues is also questions about, is this making policy analysis easier or more difficult? And so from that, I'm therefore going to, to, to focus on that and really pick up some rather some particular smaller points. Um, Perhaps, oh, this hasn't come up quite right. Well, more or less. Um, a, 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 the cynical position here, I, I kind of wondered whether I would get rid of this. And, uh, but I love this. I don't really understand Dutonsbury, but just occasionally in this particular week I did. And uh, he did a little thing on this. Uh, good morning. This is my facts, privatizing the truth since 2003. 
this is Austin, may I help you? And I, I think beautifully sums up both the questions about our doubts about facts as my social scientists and, of course, a world where people regard facts as things that can be marketed. Uh, and that, that's the cynical position. <laughs> let's go, let's kind of, kind of be a bit more positive, a bit more optimistic. What are the issues about speaking truth to power now? I think the most difficult issues tend to relate to policy advocacy rather than to the study of the policy process. Questions about who to talk to, where and how. Uh, but I've chosen to, to focus uh, on, the, on the policy process. It actually seems to me, in as much as the problems of policy advocacy are very substantial in this more complex world, that actually they need those of us who are particularly interested in policy processes rather more than has, has been the case in the past. Uh, that, that, that in, therefore, the dilemmas about understanding, understanding governance, understanding uh, the ways in which uh, the, the, the policy makers, making process is changing are things where those of us who are interested in process analysis can, can make a contribution. But we, of course, also need to look at the policy process theories, models, and concepts. Um, of course, I think that that fact that we need to look again reinforces the futility of search for universal propositions. You know, uh, you know, N Newton, Newton's theory applied last week, and now the government has changed a lot of things, and Newton's theory does, doesn't apply this week. I think is in, in, in the kind of world we're in, and so the notion of of building up a body of laws and propositions, I think, is even made more absurd by the range of modern developments. Um, but of course, so I th um, my position is therefore that process analysis is easier than policy analysis as far as speaking to power is concerned. But of course, even here, of course, the problem is we need to share power's frame of reference, and we don't necessarily do so. A changing policy process is a more complex process with the relocation of power. Uh, the kind of old model that looked at stages and roles <coughs> of the policy process and the notions about related participation points is made, being made more difficult. I continue to work in areas of implementation and one of the things that I myself and my, my Dutch colleague Peter Hooper and I have been struggling with is some of the issues which we regard as not still adequately uh, analyze about the relationship between between the details of policy formulation and the implementation process. So that an, and those things are getting more difficult. And again, that's a particular characteristic of uh, of as it were the world of governance. Um, even uh, which I suppose would be my position on the exploration of interests. In neo plural this exploration of interests is getting more difficult in the face of extreme but often covert power differences. And there is a sense, therefore, of course, where, well, it's not a question of worrying about the private government management of public money. It's a case of worrying about the private government management of the whole economy, uh, where, and within which the private management of public money is embedded. So, some discomforts here. An analysis that is increasingly sceptical about how the process works is in a difficult position to re recommend better ways of making policy. The, we have to consider the extent to which we are drawn into more fundamental questions about our society and about, uh, and about its institutions and about challenges to the dominant discourse that renders more de de detailed analysis beside the point. And I think here we therefore come back to my question about well, why are we doing it and the distinction between, on the one hand, our role as scholars and teachers, on the one hand, and the possibility of speaking truth to power, on the other. And I think to some extent there, there becomes an issue of choosing I mean, I'm, I'm past uh, the age I had to seriously choose this one, uh, but I am still teaching a bit. But there is a, clearly a set of questions about how much 
what you want to do in teaching is actually very different to what you might want to do when you're trying to, to speak to power. So, we're still trying to speak truth, but to whom? The, the old, the old just justification, the long-standing justification, particularly associated with, with Carol Weiss, is the notion of us engaged in the enlightenment function. The, we are studying the process, we study in order to make a long-run contribution. We cannot expect to see payoffs in the short run, therefore we cannot necessarily be expect to be noticed in the short run, but there should be some long-run payoff. Um, well, I think that, that, that I, I, I still stick by that, but it obviously sounds rather grandiose and optimistic. And I think many of us want to say, let's have a bit of payoff uh, before, uh, before that, before that long run. And I think there are some interesting alter alternative ways of looking at this around here, of, more, of which I think is particularly important is the idea of equipping people to deal with power. Again, I go back to, to the notion of rarely having the opportunity to speak to power with the big P. The extent to which, however, we are, on a, many of us on a regular basis, talking to people who, as I say, have to operate successfully in the, in the power system as a whole. Um, I think there's a particular role here in relation to a group of people called who in the Kingdom's theory of agenda setting he calls policy advocates or policy entrepreneurs. Um, and there's an interesting uh, contribution to this by a, uh, an American writing in the journal em Environmental Politics, Sarah Prowl or Prowler, P-R-A-L-L-E. -L -E. Uh, for those who want it more specifically, uh, it's 2009. Uh, volume 18, number 5, she looks, she applies Kingdon's theory of the policy agenda setting process to an article in which she's, she's offering to advice on policy advocates about how to operate. And her theme is climate change. And therefore she, she, what she, she sets out to do using policy process analysis to suggest ways in which people who are concerned and deeply worried about policy, of climate change can try to make contributions into debate to see to look for particular situations, particular opportunities. Uh, and it's suggested here that and therefore a knowledge of the policy process is something that can help in that respect. Um, then above all, as I've have said earlier then the teaching role um, and let me then go back to the street level bureaucracy theme <coughs> who, who I, mean, I, say, well, I say we are teaching as I say I'm not teaching very much but I'm still doing it a bit and, and indeed the people I, I, I see at the University of Brighton are very much particularly on the master's course people who are already are or soon will be small cogs in the policy system, or as in the words of the song, small bricks in the wall, um, they're broadly speaking street-level bureaucrats. And so there are important questions about educating these people, equipping them for the role they've got to uh, <coughs> occupy. And I have to say, in respect to this topic of street-level bureaucrats, I happen to believe, and it goes back, I think, to, to my past as one of them, I happen to believe in the importance of taking a positive view of that often vilified role. Um, and it does seem, again, rather important. If, 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 you, if your aim in, in teaching future junior managers, future social workers and so on, uh, if, you, if you start trying to, to tell them that they will be engaged in, in a variety of, of stereotyping and enforcing uh, social norms, uh, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, they can't do anything about it, that will be their role. You're not actually playing a very helpful role in relation uh, to their teaching. Uh, and I think it's very important to recognise the extent to which there are, uh, uh, after all, a series of, of dilemmas that a street-level bureaucrat has to deal with. Um, oh, I'm going to be well within that. Uh, 
I could, I, I, I maybe I, if I could go back to my earliest work history uh, as uh, an officer in the National Assistance Board. On my very first day, I was called in to see the manager. And the manager was a grisly old character who had been a relieving officer in the 1930s. Mm. Uh, and he set out to, to give me some advice on my job. And he made one statement that has lived with me ever since. He said, better to satisfy the coroner than to satisfy the auditor. And I, I think that it was a very interesting proposition about the role of, of the moral question that a street level bureaucrat has to deal with. Um, and I think it's important to recognize the, the significance of these moral questions. Um, the street level bureaucracy, the phenomenon of street level bureaucracy discretion is inevitable. Um, the concerns have to be with how it is used. And when you get beyond the, the set of questions about how it is used, and there's plenty of awful material around uh, about how badly it is used. Um, there's a hair-raising article by Evelyn Brodkin about uh, uh, people administering poor relief in uh, or welfare, as they call it, in Chicago, in which she describes a character she calls Mr. Frank. And Mr. Frank is a composite of a particular kind of successful <coughs> officer in this Chicago relief office. And Mr. Frank uh, has the best ratings. Uh, and he's, month after month, he's turning in tremendously good returns uh, on, his, on his work performance. Uh, so all, the, all the, the, the performance indicator things are running right for him. He's doing it by the most horrendous means. Uh, by things like calling, calling everybody to come at the same time in the morning and then making the, the, all the, the, the largely mothers make them all wait around all day until he's available to see them on the grounds that his, his time is much more important than their time. Giving them their no access to ways of communicating him, with him while they're in the office. They actually have to go outside <coughs> and use the public telephone system to get messages into him about, uh, uh, about needing to see him. Uh, he's engaging in all the sort of practices of, uh, of sending, of, in order that he can say he's referred people to jobs, sending people out for jobs he knows they haven't a, a slightest chance of being considered for. So he's engaging in a whole lot of horrendous practices of this kind. And in some ways, though, I, I, I mustn't uh, do, do injustice to Evelyn Brodkin's presentation. Uh, in some ways, she is, she's focusing on him, and fair enough, that's a problem. What she seems to me ins, ins, focuses on insufficiently is that he is working in a system in which he has... Uh, the performance indicator are laid down by his bosses and the practices that he are engaging with surely must come to the notice of his bosses. And there, so there is a series of things here where, where it seems to me it's all very well vilifying the street-level bureaucrat. The street-level bureaucrat is working in a context and we want to talk about, we want to consider what that context is. And it seems to me this is a, a good example of a current policy process issue of considerable importance. And there are, of course, some important alternatives around here. Um, and of course, they are about the extent to which there can be, in a job like this, process of co-production. As I said, the discretion has to be exercised. Uh, but it can be, in all sorts of ways, it can be reviewed. It can be reviewed with the manager. It can be reviewed with colleagues. It can be reviewed with other uh, people in other agencies. It, in, of course, indeed, as Michael Lipsky stresses in his famous original book, it can be reviewed through, can be reviewed by the clients and claimants themselves. So that there are a variety of ways of handling this issue of co-production uh, that take us far beyond the simplistic questions about uh, a <coughs> level bureaucracy.
That may seem a little bit of a digression, but I've, I've thrown it in because it seems to me as a part of the, the questions about looking at power, the importance of looking at power as a whole, and not in a sense necessarily despairing that the power at the top is not listening to us, but re recognizing the extent to which people are operating in a power context. I, my conclusions are that there are inevitably problems about speaking truth to power with complex rec recommendations. That the problem also is that we don't wish to yield the field to those who speak with simple slogans, above all, of course, the, the slogans of public choice. <coughs> but speak, there's various variations on speaking truth. There are questions about speaking truth to participants. There are questions about arming policy entrepreneurs and street-level bureaucrats for the responsibilities they have in the system of the whole. And of course, what may be most important in all is to defend the case for speaking truth to, to students as future participants in the power process. Thank you for listening to me.